Hi students, uh, what we're going to look at today is how the action potential passes along the neuron. We've looked at how it arises at one point, but now we're going to actually look at how it is propagated along the neuron from one end to the other. Um, now what I want you to do first of all though is on the screen you can see here the graph showing um, a full action potential. I want you to have a look at points A to G and just write down on a piece of scrap paper or on a piece of paper what's going on in each of those sections. So I would suggest that you pause the video and then write down what's happening and then restart it when you're ready to check your answers. OK, so let's have a little look at what's happening at each of those stages. So in stage A, we have the resting potential. So there's no stimulus there. There's no action potential. The axon is just at rest. And at that point there, we have potential difference across the membrane of minus 70 millivolts. And that is being created by those sodium potassium pumps, which are actively pumping those three sodium ions out of the axon and those two potassium ions into the active the axon now because that is an active process remember it is going to be using atp also remember that the sodium ion voltage gated channels are shut but the potassium ones are open so we have potassium ions diffusing out of the axon part b now we have stimulus the stimulus is going to start off that action potential and what that causes um, to happen along the membrane is the energy from the stimulus causes some of those sodium ion voltage gated channels to open and so we have those sodium ions diffusing down the electrochemical gradient. So once those uh, sodium ion ions start to diffuse into the axon, then, then we have positive feedback and that triggers a whole flood of more gated channels to open and so more sodium ions flood across into the axon. And that takes us to point D and at point D we now have that full action potential which is at plus 40 millivolts. Um, I should add that we call the point on the way up to the full action potential. Remember that's called depolarization. Part E, now we're on the way back down again, so we have repolarization. And what happens here is those sodium ion voltage gated channels close, though the potassium ion voltage gated channels open, and now we have potassium ions diffusing back out of the axon and so that potential difference starts to fall and become more relatively more negative. So section F is called hyperpolarization and what's happened there is we've had too many potassium ions diffuse out and so the potential difference is relatively more negative than at the resting state of minus 70 millivolts and so then we move into stage g where we have repolarization and there we're taking the potential difference across the membrane back to its resting potential so back to minus 70 millivolts and so what happens there is those potassium ion voltage gated channels shut and that sodium potassium pump kicks back in and starts actively pumping those three sodium ions out and the two potassium ions back in. And then we're back into resting state again. So hopefully you're all happy with that. If you've got any questions, then please um, just get hold of me uh, um, through the website or through um, Google Classroom. OK, so we now know how we establish an action potential at one point on the membrane. But actually, we know that that has to travel all the way down the axon from one side of the neuron to the other. So we have to propagate that action potential along the neuron. So we need to know how that happens. And it happens as a wave of depolarization. So we have depolarization at the start of the axon, and then that travels to the next section along the axon and the next section along the axon and the next section along the axon all the way down. So how does that happen? Well, if you look at the picture here, okay, what we've got is we've got up the axon and you can see that on the right hand side, we've got all our negative 
um, symbols on the inside to show that we've got that resting potential between the inside and the outside. And on the left hand side of the of the axon, we have a, a pinky area showing that that part of the axon has been depolarized. So that's where we have our action potential. OK, and that's happened as a result of all of those sodium ions flooding in. So if you look carefully at this di diagram here, what you can see is the depolarized area, which are positively charged compared to the negative on the outside of the membrane. But in the blue area, which is still polarized, we have the negative part as per the resting potential ahead of us, as it were, in the neurone. And so what happens is we have a diffusion gradient, okay, or electrochemical gradient along the axon, not across the membrane this time, but from where we are on the mem on the um, axon towards us. So we are in a positive region, but further along the axon, because it's still in the resting state, it's negatively charged, relatively negative. And so what happens in there, we get these little regions called local circuits. And those um, ions, those sodium ions that have passed in because of that action potential, now diffuse along the axon, not across the membrane here, but along the axon. And you can see that denoted by the little dotted kind of arrows, which showing those ions moving forward. And as they do that, okay, they cause those sodium voltage gated channels to open at the next point along the membrane. And so then, of course, inflow those sodium ions and then that part of the membrane now becomes depolarized. Now along behind us, as it were, where we've just had our depolarization, those sodium voltage gated channels close, the potassium ones open, and so those potassium ions start to now leave the axon. So as you can see here, so we're beginning to move along the axon. So that region in front of us is still polarized, but now it's we're obviously shifted along a little bit. Um, and the region behind us is now beginning to be repolarized after the initial depolarization at that point. So on this slide here, now what you can see is that polarized region still at the very right hand side of the neuron. Then we've got the depolarized region, which is where the action potential is at the moment. Then we've got the repolarized region in yellow. And then on the very left hand side, we've gone back to being polarized again. And so that action potential is being moved along the neuron in a wave. Um, and we call that propagation along the neuron. Now, what we have because we have a kind of a, a gap between the two polarised regions, it means that there is a short period of time when the axon cannot be excited again and when we can't have another action potential. Now that is called the refractory period. You do need to know the name of that, that's the refractory period. And at that, the advantageous part of that is that one, it means that the action potential is unidirectional. It can't go back on itself. It can only go in one direction. And so impulses only travel in one direction along a neuron. And it also means that we don't get overlapping action potentials. OK, so we know how the action potential is propagated along the neuron. But remember, we've got two different types of neuron that we have to understand. We've got ones which have um, a myelin sheath and ones which don't. And we call the conduction along neurons that have a myelin sh sheath saltatory conduction. Because what happens there is we have those local circuits set up from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier. So the impulse actually jumps from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier all the way down that neuron. So we have an action potential which is generated at the first node of Ranvier, and then we have the next action potential generated at the next node of Ranvier. And what that means is because we are using less sodium-potassium pumps to pull things back to the resting potential, 
it means that we can use less ATP because we um, we only need to create that resting potential at those key points along the neuron. If we don't have a myelin sheath, because there's therefore no insulation, we have to generate an action potential at all the way along that axon. So there's very small differences or very small space between um, each action potential that is needing to be generated. We can no longer jump along. And so therefore the speed of conduction really, really reduces with non-myelinated um, axons. And so what organisms have to do to overcome that is they can have larger axons and that's um, you can give an example of squid squid axons are looked at a lot because they're very large and they allow the um, sodium ions to diffuse more quickly because there's less resistance within the axoplasm okay which is basically the cytoplasm inside the axon because it's it's um because it's much larger there is less resistance the other thing that can happen is that we can increase the temperature around those neurons or in those neurons and because of that that just speeds up the diffusion of those sodium ions but you've got to remember that once we reach a particular temperature usually around 40 degrees c all of a sudden those sodium potassium pumps are going to start to be denatured because they're they're create, made from proteins the other um the gated channels the proteins that they're made from will also start to denature so temperature will only increase the speed up to a particular point So the final part you need to know about here is the all or nothing principle. And if you look at the graph at the top here, the top graph, um, you can see that we've got two um, regions, two kind of green bumps in the graph where um, the stimulus has been um, kind of received, but it isn't enough to cause the, the full action potential. So that means that we've got those sodium ions flooding into the axon, but not enough of them to give that full change from minus 70 millivolts to plus 40 millivolts. But then you can see the third one along, now we've got a slightly higher threshold um, stimulus, which has caused that action potential. The fourth one, again, we have a bigger stimulus now but the threshold is the same and so the action potential is the same so we do have what's called an all or nothing response where actually the size of the stimulus doesn't affect the strength of the action potential the action potential is either all or nothing and it depends on on us meeting that original threshold we hit the threshold and away it goes or we don't hit the threshold and so we don't generate an action potential